Hi there, everybody, and welcome to session three of Mastermind Live 2023. So today, in this session, our third session, we're actually going to be talking about the procurement metaverse. I'm really excited for this conversation. We're going to, it's titled Imagining the Power of the Procurement Metaverse. And we're joined by Clive Heal. Clive is the founder and CEO of Lavinia AI. And Clive, you've got pretty deep background in procurement and procurement innovation as well that you are bringing to your role at Avenue AI. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Phil. So I wonder if you could just start by telling us a little bit about how and why AI seized your imagination enough that you wanted it to really be the foundation of building a company around it. Yeah, so in 2019, I went to the Global Innovation Conference, which that year was in Florence. Uh, which is reputedly has includes the top 500 innovation people globally. I don't count myself in that list, mm -hmm. by the way, but there are some great people there at the event. There were 200 presentations about AI. And I sat on the first day or the second day and watched through eight back-to-back -back presentations about work that's going on in AI. And it made me realize that AI is coming everywhere. And this was now four years ago, just over, just over four years ago. So it made me think, wow, this is obviously a big opportunity and yeah. how do we bring AI into procurement? One thing I just did want to add, um, Phil, is that the keynote speaker at that, the, the start of the event talked about the biggest in, uh, hurdles to innovation in corporate life and number two was procurement, which totally mm -hmm. blew me away in terms of how could he possibly say that because obviously we were out there to search for innovation. But but it came from that and, and, and a need and a desire to bring AI into a in in positively into the way that we work in procurement, not not just about taking out jobs, but how can we help um, build competency and yeah. do something that's really a value. Now, this is a little bit off topic, but I think still kind of in keeping with how you answered that, you talked about procurement being a roadblock of innovation. You know, in your um, corporate career, you spent a lot of time in driving innovation uh, and, and procurement being a driver of innovation. I just wonder if you could share a little bit about kind of what were some of the keys or the tips that you found were really helpful in positioning procurement as being an innovation driver for corporate side as opposed to being that roadblock. I think the this is actually Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Um, you know, like I need food, warmth and shelter first before mm -hmm. I get to the top of the pyramid. And so if you're driving innovation in procurement, look to solve a business issue first, because if, if there's a burning platform in the business, your business partner has a particular issue or business need, if you can bring something innovative that solves that business need, you know, bring them, bring them the yeah. food and water and the warmth. Don't bring them a shiny new bicycle because that's no good. They're hungry and they're starving. So, so look to use procurement innovation to address big business needs because then you'll find that the business actually want to work with you because because it's a value to them you can take the shiny new toy later and and bring something new to them later but if you can solve a business issue first you know that that gets your buy-in your trust they understand your process and they're and they're willing to work with you so so my first bit of advice would be address a business need my other yeah. bit, bit of advice i would say would be to um involve clearly define what the issue is you're trying to address and involve people who report to the decision maker in the creative process because they naturally then become owners and ambassadors for the solutions mm. that you're developing and so on so so involve those decision makers direct reports if you can in the creativity stage the ideation stage interesting so they become advocates then to then push to join you on the journey to kind of influence up Exactly. And it's kind of surprising because if you're in a workshop with 15 people all generating ideas, the day later, nobody actually remembers whose idea was that. Mm -hmm. It's our idea. It's the team's idea and, and the team own that. And so the team then will take it forward. Right? Yeah, it's interesting. In the first session of the day today, we talked about how you know all functions across the organization are kind of in this place where the, that we all feel like we should be more get more appreciation perhaps for what we do, but that actually drives an opportunity for us to collaborate more on what the goals of the business are, as opposed to just trying to focus on our own little silos. I actually believe that procurement should know what are the top 10 business issues of our yeah. company and how many of those can I support and enable and create you know, something innovative that will help with that with that business issue. Obviously, not all of them. I can't come up with a, with a new formulation for a drug, but I can help with the manufacturing yeah. process to solve a problem on the line. So how do we do that? Yeah, yeah and helps uh, speed. 
help bring things to market faster, for example, when you talk about yep. drug development. Exactly. Um, now, uh, going back to kind of the topic of the conversation today, uh, generative AI has, has been something that's at least been in the public eye for about a year now. I think it was last November that uh, ChatGPT was dropped upon us. Um, yep. It's probably progressing faster than most of us are probably aware of. So I wonder if you could share a little bit about what are you keeping your eye on from a generative AI perspective? And actually, while you're as you're thinking about that, I'd love everybody who's listening to the session to just kind of put in the chat, is your organization thinking about or uh, looking at using generative AI in any way at the moment? Just because I want to see a little bit of if folks are using it in the real world. Um, but coming back to the question, like, what are some of the developments that you're keeping your eye on the most from a generative AI, yeah, AI so, perspective? So, Phil, over the last year, there's been a lot of techniques developed for prompt engineering, right? So, yeah. zero shot, um, multi shot, chain of thought, tree of tree of tree of thought, um, different model guided processes, iterative prompt prompt role prompting. So, this is like um, give me the response in the in the style of that sort of thing as well. So. And, and I'll give you some examples as, as we talk today. Um, you know, in 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 Lavenir AI, um, our sales avatars have personas, so you can bring mm -hmm. in a response that is in a style of a particular particular salesperson. But but just looking ahead, um, RAG, which is retrieval augmented generation. So this is where where you're using the technology to go out and find bits of data from targets that you select and bring that back in into the into the response so this makes it a a, a richer response i think one of the uh, one of the technologies i think that's really going to come to the fore is conversational ai right mm -hmm. so you know i'm a certified two finger typist right and i have <laughs> been forever right and i can talk a lot faster than i can type and so Conversational AI opens up the opportunity to have conversations that's free form human conversations yeah. with avatars and get the response. So we're going to see we're going to see you know, voice to text, text to voice, and the ability for me to have a, a you to have conversations, which is way way faster than you know me and my and my two finger typing. And you know, and again in in Lavenir we have conversational AI. So you're also going to see fine tuning and agents as well. So there's a lot's happened in the last year. I think I think in procurement we're still at the sort of basic prompt engineering stage, but mm -hmm. there's some really clever things you can do. You know, get you know, ChatGPT, Claude Lambda two, whoever, you, whatever you're using, right? Get get it to to come up with four different alternatives and argue against itself against which is the best one and give you the best of the best if you like. So get get ChatGPT to to create different alternatives, right? So that these are these are different techniques that you can use in the whole prompt engineering uh, uh, space to get a better a, get a better response. But mm -hmm. I would say to answer the question, RAG retrieval augmented generation, conversational AI, those are uh, two things worth watching because that's going to change again the way that we use it. Yeah, that, that I see in the chat. There's a few comments that we've got around, um, um, you know. So a few yeses here. There's uh, using AI in our CLM and risk mitigation. Right now, we're looking at all the options, evaluating out processes, uh, and using it to improve writing. Um, so there's lots of different um, kind of use cases, I think, that folks are testing within their organizations to dip their toe um, in the water. So um, you know, one of the things you said about conversational AI, what's interesting to me of that is that, as you talked about, you know, we're talking to AI, it means that we have to be, we don't have to think so much about the structure of how you ask for the information. And I think that's one of the blockers to accessing information is you have this, okay, how do I say this in a way that's going to be made it, make it understood by a computer to then translate it into language that a computer understands? Yeah, prompt engineering is very much about how you actually phrase the question. Even there's even data that shows if you're more emotional, you can get a better response or mm -hmm. whatever. So, so how you actually, you know, and how you how you actually set out, you know, the, the, the putting the message over in terms of the the content, the response that you're looking for, and so on. So there is a lot in that. But conversational AI opens up the opportunity for us all to naturally talk to the yeah. technology and get a, re a verbal response or, or a written response, if you like, type response back. So, so, th so that's why I think conversational AI is, is, the, is another, another opportunity for everyone. So how does um, AI change or how do you see gen, um, generative AI changing the skill sets for procurement professionals? Right. The, the, 
generative AI, I think, is fantastic in terms of what it's bringing to us and what will what will come in the future. The dis a disappointing part for me is is it's really a leveler. Um, let me let me let me explain what I mean by that. Right, if you put in if everybody in different companies puts in the same the same prompt, they'll get pretty much the same the mm -hmm. same response, right? So what that does it it lets the it lets the procurement people and the companies that are maybe are the laggards and some way behind, it actually gives them the answer. But the but that in itself is a is a problem because you need to understand what it's telling you from a procurement perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, if a if a if a three year old on, on a calculator types in three times three, it's gonna say nine, right? Well, the, the three-year-old doesn't know whether nine is right or wrong, but the yeah. three-year-old doesn't understand, well, why is it nine? Well, it's because it's yeah. three plus three plus three, right? So the need to really understand the output, I, th I think, is, 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 in, is important um, because, because it brings everybody up to a level. But because it brings up to everybody up to a level, this is where I think the answer to your question comes in terms of what are the changes in the skill sets for procurement mm -hmm. people going to be. One of them, well, I think there's there's two or three, right? The, the first one is is actual human empathy, yeah. okay? Because this technology is coming in and our business partners can use it themselves, right? What's the value that procurement people bring? Why do I need a, a, a procurement person? What's he or she going to do to help me? So the ability for us to connect empathically with our business partners and our suppliers will help open up, create relationships and help open up opportunities, if you like, to to go beyond the technology, we have to go beyond AI. So what is the role of procurement beyond AI? Or is there a role for procurement? I think mm -hmm. the answer is yes, because of that human side. Another competency I think will come to the fore, uh, and it'll be really important, is unpredictability, right? Yeah. If everybody puts the same thing in and gets the same response, right? I want people on my team who are unpredictable and can come up with ideas and concepts and strategies that the technology itself didn't come up with, mm -hmm. actually. But it's a, this is the divine move. You know, this is Lisa Doll, move 78 in Go, right? If you, I don't know if you saw the film or whatever, right? Coming up with a move that the AI would not come up with, didn't come up with, and won the game, right? Okay, yeah. he only won one out of five. I get that. But but it's, it's the unpredictability. And so the great thing for me is this will drive diversity. We will mm -hmm. need more diverse people in procurement because of the technology. If the technology is if regenerative AI is sort of standardizing until we can break it apart, create our own lang our, our own large language models and so on within our company and our own our own ways of doing it. How do we do that? Well, we're going to need this this unpredictability, but this diversity of thinking. So creativity flourishes at the interface of diversity and experience, yeah. right? So how do we have that experience, the understanding of what it's telling us? I, I don't want to just follow what it, what what ChatGPT or Claude tells me. I actually want to build on that and create something which is unique and innovative and different than every other company is doing with with maybe the same initial sort of output. So I yeah. think the great thing is diversity come, comes from this, right? Yeah, so if um, you know, generative AI becomes a, you know, competitive advantage goes away to a certain level because everyone's at the same level now. It's now how do you go beyond that level? And actually everything that, that used to go into getting you to that level below becomes commoditized at best from a skill set and irrelevant at worst because the technology is getting you to that level. You don't need people to do it. Um, and so that's where the big shift is going to come. Yep, yep. People still have to understand what it is they're doing, the strategies yeah. they're creating, how they're deploying it. Why did it say do one, two, and three? And what do one, two, and three actually mean, right? Yeah, the critical thinking. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. So we we labeled this session around the metaverse. So I wonder if you could share a little bit about what the metaverse is and, and why is it going to happen? Um, it's already happening. The metaverse mm -hmm. is basically a VR-enabled world. So you get you get yourself a, a headset, you put the headset on, and you're into a you're into a different into a different world, a virtual world. But it's going to happen really for three main reasons. The the first one is the the metaverse. Um, so this is this virtual world, if you like. The, yeah. the metaverse is actually covering both, or more than both, three, the consumer, social, and enterprise business. So what that means is, because there are portals and people are building portals, and that's why Mark Zuckerberg won't be able to control the one and only metaverse because mm -hmm. of the portals, you'll be able to 
from a consumer perspective, you'll be able to go in and buy things using you know through through in the in this in this virtual world in this in this metaverse world, right? You'll also be able to have your social interactions with your friends, uh, which may be real or they may be actually avatars and they may not be real. And that's the, that's the whole separate thing, right? And then then the enterprise where you can actually do your do your work in the metaverse as well. So because all three things are coming and because of portals, which will enable you to go from, you know, I'm sat here, you know, I, I'm it looks like I'm on I'm on a beach with you, you know, you're somewhere mm -hmm. else, I'm I'm here. I'm on a beach. You're on the same beach. We're sat drinking beer together. I see you sat next to me. You see me sat next to you socially. But of course, we're you know two thousand miles apart yeah. or whatever, right? The consumer. And let me give you another example. The consumer side is already ready here. Uh, I'll give you an example. You can Monaco already has a digital twin of a Monaco, right? Of the of the of the of the principality. You can put on a headset today. And go into a store in Monaco and buy items, hard real mm -hmm. items, not just virtual items. You can buy hard real items. So, you know, Manila Di Giovanni, who is the 23 year old CEO of the Monaco uh, metaverse, right? And she'll be the future CEO, I'm sure, of Facebook Meta in 10 years' time, right? So she has created this, this, this this VR city and you can spend money there. So you've got the consumer side being able to spend money. You've got the social side and you've got the, the, the business side as well. So the first reason is it's going to cover all of them. And you go from one to another. The second reason is there are lots of companies building all of the infrastructure that's needed. You know, the payment systems, the, the, the security systems, all the different platforms, but there's also lots and lots of companies built already creating creating products and services to on the metaverse. So, you know, when I got the first iPhone, iPhone one, there was no app store. Right. Now there's 2.2 million apps on my phone, yep. but in the metaverse, there are already thousands of companies building their products ready, ready to be there. And the third reason is it's actually, um, it's actually addictive. It's an escape from reality, right? You, when you put on a VR headset, you are in a very immersive, very different world very divorced from wherever you currently live and how you currently work, right? It's creating a better, better environment. I actually think the drug use will go down in 10 years time because mm -hmm. people will become addicted and they'll, they'll be happier because they're able to spend time in the metaverse rather than their, the reality of their, of their, of their lives. Last year, Phil, McKinsey came out with a, with a, with a paper that said, that said in five years time, 15% of corporate revenues will be through the metaverse mm -hmm. and, and it's already coming. Right. And, and, and that's only four years away now. So we're going to see a lot, lot more happening in the metaverse. So who owns the metaverse or is there a singular owner or is each platform like you go to Monaco and Monaco is owned by somebody or an entity or an organization, you know, you go to Facebook's or Meta's metaverse yeah, yeah. that's owned by, you know, Meta. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Is that kind of how it's structured at the moment? Well, there are, there are different there there are different environments, and you can go out and spend a lot of money on land if you want. And I mm -hmm. I wouldn't personally recommend that right now. You can also go out and spend money. I, you may have seen on 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 your own designer wear for avatars, right? So these are over a million dollars now. Like, who's going to spend a million dollars on an avatar design? But there are there are there are multiple metaverses out there, and and the portals allow you to go from 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 uh from one to one to the one to the other right? yeah. and and i you know i gotta say that you know, now the technology is coming down in price right you know the latest headsets are 500 dollars. that's half the price of my phone right my phone's a thousand dollars and my headsets my headset you know years ago i remember thinking i'm never going to buy a big cell phone because they're like the size of a brick and of course now i get one every year yeah, and people are thinking i'm never going <laughs> to buy a headset but yeah. they will buy headsets Right. Um, so when we think, because I think something like the metaverse is something that, you know, you get adoption first, probably in the consumer or mm -hmm. people can start seeing use cases in, in consumer and it yeah, yeah. Is, is, it then follows into enterprise. So when we think mm -hmm. about the procurement future, what could the procurement metaverse look like? Yeah, I think, I think in the procurement metaverse for ultimately, I think this is where all procure tech sits. I think the procure tech sits in the procurement metaverse. The procurement metaverse, think of that as a subset of the metaverse, right? The metaverse yeah. is everywhere where you've got your consumer, social, uh, and enterprise. But the procurement metaverse, I think, becomes our workspace. It's where we 
sit and meet and talk to our suppliers and our business partners. And it's where all the ProcureTech sits as well. I believe in five years time, all ProcureTech will be in the metaverse. And that is where you will, you will uh, connect with it. That's where you'll utilize it. That's where you'll have your meetings with, with, with suppliers. It be it will be the avatar maybe of the suppliers that you're that you're talking to and and that they're maybe talking to 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 your av avatar avatar as well. So the uh, the the VR headset replaces the Zoom call, but then you go one step further and it's actually this is where the, you bring the AI back into the conversation because you have avatar your avatar who's been trained on your organization's uh, culture way of thinking you know what's uh, ranges of accept uh, acceptability versus what's not acceptable and now you have two avatars on both sides of the table talking you don't actually have a physical human having a conversation with each other it's going to be really fun i mean I, I, I mean just an example i'm already using my headset to make my whatsapp calls right when you talk to mm -hmm. me on whatsapp you're not talking to me on my phone you're talking to me on my on my on my on my headset a and just talking about this in terms of we can already photorealistic avatars are pretty much here now. That means an avatar that looks just like just like a real a real person, right? And so you're going to be able to create certainly next year. You can you can already create now an avatar that looks like you, sounds like you, mm -hmm. but because you can put the persona behind it as well, you'll be able to create an avatar that that is Phil, right? You know, he'll it'll probably be your best mate because it knows you yeah. better than you do. Yeah. You know, it, it really understands your persona. You'll be able to have a conversation in terms of, hey Phil, what should we do tonight? I don't know. Why don't we go for a, for a Mexican? Good idea, Phil. Mm. I like I like Mexican <laughs> food, right? And of course it knows because it knows you better than yeah. you know you because it's it's built on that. And so that's kind of interesting in terms of what does that what does that mean? You are going to start to see avatars on tv and ultimately in movies you know the 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 hollywood try try canute and stop the water the tide coming in but it's a bit like the coal miners of 30 years ago right it's gone right that time's gone the 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 the, the avatars are, are taking over i'll give you an example there's already a uh, television uh, news channel in new zealand where the avatars, photorealistic avatars, are reading the news. They're 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 not real people. You will get digital immortality, Phil. You you will be able to create next year. You can already create an avatar now that looks like you and sounds like you and starts to have your persona. A year from now, that avatar will be your digital immortality because it'll live. You know when when you when you've when you've when you've passed in terms. So in terms of the workplace, yeah. though, what does that mean for how we interact with with suppliers and the data that we have in the way that we interact and and how that we how that we interact with them i can i can imagine already um an avatar doing all the podcasts and webinars while i'm out there traveling the world or sat on the beach somewhere um, well yeah but you'll still be behind it feeding it mm -hmm. the information it'll be it'll be phil's persona it'll look like you it'll sound like you but you know you're sat on the beach drinking a yep. beer while the, the avatar <laughs> is doing the ten thousand podcast that day right if you want right um, we're getting some questions and I'd encourage anybody to submit any more. We've probably got five or six minutes left of the session. Um, for me, there's a, an interesting one I want to bring in in a second, but I do want to just ask about, you talked about using VR. When do you actually see, uh, kind of what kind of time frame are we talking about to have VR enabled products uh, specifically targeted at procurement professionals and helping procurement professionals do their jobs? So, well, in our in Lavender AI, we have our VR product coming in Q1, like Q1 next mm -hmm. next year, piloting it with a uh, a large global organization, and then it'll be out in Q2 next year. So I think you are going to start to see VR products coming. The internet itself is going to get consumed into VR. I mean, you think of the internet right now as you know 2D, a laptop and a and yeah. a keyboard, right? That is going to go, right? There won't be laptops in ten years' time. You won't need it. You won't need the phone either, because it'll be within your in your VR headset. The VR headsets get getting smaller. They're getting better. The five hundred dollar ones already better than the fifteen hundred dollar one mm -hmm. last year. So the technology is getting getting better. It will become the way that we're the the way that we work using the device, both socially, commercially, and, and you know, business and consumer. Sort of thing. So uh, there's a question from Sharon. Sharon asked it while we're talking about generative AI. Who owns AI generated content, or you know what the 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 murky waters of IP, I guess, around AI generated content? And maybe there isn't an answer for that yet. But any thoughts on that? 
I, I, I'm not sure there really is an answer for that. Um, it's going to get we're already seeing some really interesting things because um, chat GPT, for example, open AI, um, it's, it's published in terms of where they got a lot of their information from initially when they did the, you know, the first September um, uh, scoop of data. Some of the companies that they used are actually pushing back and actually trying to block open AI in the future, mm -hmm. scraping information from their data sets. And so, we're going to see this this battle, I think, you know, and I certainly think that large organizations are going to be creating their own large large language models. They'll be doing that themselves because in, in order to create something unique, right, you have to have, you know, it's all about battle of the algorithms and the data. Yeah. You're going to have to start to create something that is your corporate data to set if you like and because in this race to insights in terms of getting information first and competitive advantage you know getting shorter how do you do that you know in procurement how do we because of this leveler issue how do we stay ahead of the competition how do the better organizations stay ahead how are they going to leverage the technology to, to to their advantage in a ways that other companies are not able to to do so, so it is going to become the battle of the algorithms. What's your what's your data set? Mm -hmm. Where are you pulling it from? How do you get to those insights quicker than the other other people? It, procurement becomes the race to insights and the battle of the algorithms. So we have a question from Peter: uh, What will be the single largest breakthrough for added value for the procurement function besides the entertainment aspect? Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not a gamer at all. I'm actually not interested in in playing mm -hmm. games on, on my on my headset. Uh, it, it's like, how do we? How are we going to use the? You, are you talking generative AI or the metaverse? Yeah, like, like, I think generative mm -hmm. AI or the metaverse. You know, the things that we've talked right. about today from a um, a value added perspective is the one thing over right. everything else that you look at and say, you know, that's where the procurement use case is going. Oh, that's where we should be focusing. I think it's about the insights. I think it's mm -hmm. about the the opportunity to identify. If, if if the role of procurement becomes to creation of the value opportunity pathway, so the different ways the business could go, we could do this. Here's the cost. Here's the risk. Here's the benefits. We could do this. Here's the cost. Here's the risk. Here's the benefit. So as we create these value opportunity pathways for the business, right? It's how do we have the insights to come up with something unique and something different that actually helps drive competitive advantage through procurement. Yeah. I don't. I believe the role of procurement is not about placing purchase orders. Mm -hmm. It's about creating value for the business, and that helps drive, you know, customer service, helps drive revenue, helps reduce the cost of the business, helps improve business efficiencies, helps reduce the times, and so on. Helps improve the quality. So it's like how we're we using the technology to, to optimize the value that we're able to create and deliver. So I got, we've got a couple of minutes left. So my last question uh, for today is around positioning ourselves today. How should we be thinking about the change that's coming that you've outlined, that you've talked about today? How do we position ourselves to success as procurement, either professionals, procurement leaders for our teams? Like what's the, how should we even start thinking about this? I think, Phil, we've got to embrace the technology. We've got to be looking ahead. We've got to be seeing what's coming. You know, everybody, everybody hopefully is creating a digital tech roadmap right now in terms of what they're doing, what's in their tech stack, what they're doing. Hopefully everybody, everybody in procurement is doing that, I hope, I hope so. Um, and, and as you do that and look ahead, it's like, okay, so what's coming in the technology field? Well, what is what is the metaverse going to mean to us? What does generative AI? Generative AI is something that everybody can use, that, that you, can, you can collaborate on that is going to come in all every procure tech is going to have some sort of you know ai engine driving it ultimately i think so, but how do we think about the changes it's going to make you know we, we've already seen how rpa machine machine learning is on is taking out the transactional stuff and people are going yeah you know, we're beyond that now so we're now we're at the point of okay what's the new technology that's coming and how can we embrace that and how can we use that at the same time as the competency thing that we talked about earlier in terms of we're going to need different people. We're going to need people who understand this technology and can leverage it. Right? If you've got a Ferrari, you have to know how to drive, right? It's no point mm -hmm. having a Ferrari if you can't drive. It's useless. Well, this is fascinating. You know, I think the future is here today, uh, you know, when we're talking about just how fast the advances have been. And I know it's not 
it's funny anything that just kind of feels like to the masses it came out of nowhere doesn't come out of nowhere there's been decades of research and activity that have gone into where we are today from the ai perspective and from the metaverse but now we're seeing the use cases and the technology is moving so fast that it's allowing us to really start putting it into practice at scale um so i'm fascinated to see where we go we'll have to uh, make sure that we uh, we keep talking to you to see how things are evolving and um, you know what we should be looking out for. So Clive, I want to thank you so much for joining me on uh, this session here at AOP Mastermind Live 2023. Phil, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And get yourself one of these. <laughs> there you go. Headsets for all of us. Um, so our next session, we're going to start in about five minutes time. You can go out into the lobby. Um, you'll be able to see the session and then join um, from the lobby. I'm going to be doing a, a virtual run into the next studio, I think. And that's going to be um, talking about services procurement. And we're going to be talking about an AOP survey that we did in uh, collaboration with SAP around how we buy services. So I will see everybody in three or four minutes, and Clive, one last time, thanks so much.